Welcome everyone to AZ Bio Peers. Today we're talking about how do you build an investable team? And we have some amazing people who are going to share their insights. Um, they are business builders and investors. So um, with that, we are going to kick things off and I will introduce um, each of our panelists who will then tell you a little bit about themselves. And um, Mara, would you please kick us off? Happy to. Great to see everybody this morning. Thank you, Joan and James and David. Um, I, uh, brief background, I have spent most of my career in operating roles running large and small companies. I used to be CEO of Ventana Medical, now Roche Tissue Diagnostics, president of Genzyme Genetics, mostly as uh, those in the industry know in the diagnostics field. But I'm also going to mention, because I think it may be relevant today, is I ran a startup um, we raised a whopping 26 million. And to give you a perspective, 15 years ago, we were the number one money raiser in Massachusetts uh, at 20, 26 million, non-therapeutic. So it was quite, um, quite extraordinary how things have changed. And the company was a complete failure. Um, we did not get money back to our investors. Um, product after product failed. And um, I mentioned that one cathartic for me as I, you know, continue to embrace it years and years later, but it taught me a lot of lessons. And I think that to anyone who's had failures so far or will have them in the future, it's really important to understand the lessons you learn. Today, I run Bluestone Venture Partners, a venture firm focused on the mountain Southwest, um, what we call the NATO states. New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and Oklahoma. We have nine investments, three in Arizona, already sold one of them, and uh, raising money for our second fund. I also work with the federal government and the Rockefeller Foundation on COVID testing and um, general COVID policies. So great to be here um, and very happy to participate in this discussion. Actually, I'm sorry, I'll mention one other thing. Founder of the School of Diagnostics at Arizona State University. I was going to say, that's one of your proudest accomplishments. I, I know. <laughs> that That's less about building a team, but it is something that I am incredibly proud of. So if anyone wants to know about the school, get to me later. Awesome. Jim? So I'm Jim Golka. I lead Arizona Tech Investors. It's the angel group in Phoenix. We're 108 men and women who invest our own money in startups. Uh, as a as as a data point, we've invested in 35 life science deals over the years. 33 of them I've managed, so I've done a, a lot of investing there. I've uh, done private equity deals in years gone by, and and I've uh, been the CEO of three software companies: uh, uh, one angel, two angel funded, one VC funded, one I sold to Steve Jobs. Uh, so uh, been on both the success and failure platforms for software. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, James. And, and you know, Jim, you have done such an amazing job with ATI. Um, and you've been there now for how many years? Well, and are you going to be leading the team next year? Nope, I'm retiring on December 31 from the leadership of the group. They'll stay an investor. Well, uh, we're never going to let you get very far away, but thank <laughs> you for everything that you've done for yeah. the community. David, you're up. I'm David Young and Tob. Uh, I think the reason Joan thought I'd be good for this is because of a, a role I have with Willamette Valley Capital, where I am a director. Willamette Valley Capital is an early stage venture fund that invests in deep tech. We are based out of Oregon, the Willamette Valley. Uh, that's where I spent nine years. And uh, the, the group has actually... Um, interesting probably to people on this call because we're a venture entity, a venture fund that um, is a startup itself. So uh, it's been really fun for me to do mentoring in AZ Bio and get invited to do this because I get to uh, sit next to people on a peer level that really I look up to and think, you know, if, if you were to switch the roles for some of the entrepreneurs, it'd be like a first time entrepreneur being on a panel with someone who you know, was on their third or fourth company with, you know, maybe an exit or two at, or an IPO under their belt. So uh, it's really cool for me to be here. Um, so five years of venture deal experience before and after uh, going to business school. 
Um, the reason I got interested in entrepreneurship and venture investing was because of a failed startup of my own. Um, Cyano Solutions was attempting to develop uh, preclinical uh, or advanced preclinical work around the drug technology of the University of Oregon that would make chemo drugs safer so we could turn chemotherapy drugs into pro drugs that don't activate until they're in the tumor. Uh, company ran out of money, so I went through that experience. Uh, we had a wake <laughs> for the company. But um, yeah, I've uh, spent four years uh, building and launching uh, accelerators at co-working spaces in Oregon, so I know entrepreneurs well. Uh, I know the entrepreneurship community in Oregon really well. I'm starting to learn it the last couple of years here in Arizona. Um, and I've also professionally uh, done uh, technology development capital for Intel for two years. And now I am a manager in corporate business development with uh, Nagra Kodelsky. We're a global security technology firm out of Switzerland. And I uh, work on managing our innovation investment across a few different business units, cybersecurity, um, Internet of Things, public access, and um, cyber, wait, digital TV. <laughs> That's our fourth. Shows how much I need to rehearse that. But anyways, I think I've said enough. Nice to be here. Thanks, David. And you know, as we continue this discussion, and this really is going to be a discussion. So many times, um, you know, we have panels and there's formal questions. We're all friends. We're not always going to agree on some of the things that we say. Um, and that's the best part of a discussion like this, because you get to hear the perspectives of four people who have built companies, invested in companies, worked with companies, and um, are sharing their time with you today. So to all of our panelists, thank you so much. Um, to to kind of get things started, our focus today is building an investable team. Jim, what's an investable team? Ah, so the, if when you, the word invest make matters a lot here because. Some people think, well, I've got a great idea and maybe I've done some research, maybe even published a paper. So therefore I should be able to just ask people for money and they will give it to me because my idea is great. In science and in engineering and, and in general terms, that's not investable. That is, those are ideas that may be funded. Uh, the, the likelihood for funding for those kinds of, that sort of stage of development are things called grants. Grants are given to people to explore ideas where an outcome is not necessarily predetermined or is going to generate any kind of economic opportunity. Investors are interested in investing for an economic return. Therefore, they're looking at businesses. So it's the, the definition really is what's an investable business. And so if you start with the team of scientists, engineers, uh, doctors, nurses who come up with a new idea, whether it's a device, a diagnostic, a therapy, that's great. And that needs to be sufficiently robust to be able to apply for grants, whether it's from the feds or from the Flynn Foundation or anywhere around, and start to coalesce about what it is that they think they can bring to market. And then the first important team decision is the hardest one of all for, the, for those scientific founders. And that is to acknowledge that their skill set is not the skill set to build a business. It's to do that research and intellectual investigation. And so the first team action is to hire a CEO and give authority to the CEO to build the business. And to do that, recognizing that their skill sets of the to do business that are intellectually approximately equal to what it is they do. And I can tell you, I've run into myriad scientists and physicians who are happy to have some water carrier guy do all the scut work that they don't want to do, but they think that they're gonna make all the decisions because business is less important than the scientific research that they start with. So there needs to be a successful uh, discovery of a person who will collaborate with them. Examples are, we did one that I won't name, or we looked at one very intensely. We liked the science a lot. It was a very elegant solution to a problem. And we recommended an individual to be the CEO who was a perfect fit. 
the founders agreed and then said, yeah, we're going to hire that person as CEO, but I'll make all the final decisions. That was seven or eight years ago. That company has never, ever raised any money. Compare that to a company like GT Medic, uh, Techn Technologies, you know, Matt Lykins' company. The scientists at Barrow were smart enough to hire Matt. This business is growing enormously. We've invested six times in that company. So that's the key decision. Now, the, the issues about the rest of the team are uh, skills that the CEO needs to have to understand regulatory pathways and to get a, a proper regulatory consultant to make sure that patent applications are submitted properly by a patent attorney. Because without patents, there is no intellectual property, which means there's not much that a lot of companies want to acquire. And the third part of that is to understand truly who the buyers are going to be of this business, since very, very few startups become independent public companies. And Great. so it, thanks. It, yeah. Yeah, it's that that's a really good, you know, explanation. Samara, so you were the non-scientist CEO that was brought into emerging and growing life science companies. As you for you as the CEO, what were the things that you looked at when you made the decision to join those teams? Well, I, uh, three things. And first of all, let me just agree with everything Jim said and say that I'm an investor um, and um, with GT MedTech. So just to put that out there, so completely agree and a lot of uh, thumbs up for uh, for Matt Likens, who won a Fastlane Award with AC Bio in the past as well. But what I look for um, from my old days at Bain & Company, it's three things. One is the foundation of intelligence. And intelligence, as everybody knows, is not one simple answer, but relevant intelligence. But most importantly, it's somebody who has the fire in the belly, who can, I like to say, will not take no for an answer and um, fights as hard as is appropriate. Now, sometimes you have to take no at some point, but somebody who takes, who won't take no as an answer. And the second thing, which I think is over, often overlooked, but implied in Jim's comments, which is somebody who will take guidance. And, um, you know, it's easy to say people who take guidance from a board, but, uh, you know, pet peeve, I can't stand people who say they're always taking guidance and every board meeting, they agree with everything I say and everybody else says. And quite frankly, they're really only doing that to nod and make people feel good and have no, no interest um, in going forward. So people who genuinely take guidance from their junior team, from their senior team, from their peers and from the board, but it doesn't mean blindly just take it. It means argue when they need to and then make a decision, but truly listen. That's what I look for. Thanks. David, are you with us? Okay. He may be dealing with that little springing emergency that sprung up. Um, so as we look at, you know, building these teams, right? And every conversation that we've had, every panel over the last decade with investors, it's the team, it's the team, it's the team. We look at the team. Okay, I'm a little startup. I don't have any money. How do I get a CEO if I don't have any money? Guys? Well, a CEO is, who is interested in leading a startup better be interested in being rewarded for the building of the business and not looking for a lot of current income. You know, if I swan into an opportunity and I'm expecting to make a half a million dollars a year because I'm so wonderful, the door is over there. You know, it's those are uh, corporate uh, settings. Uh, the person really needs to be motivated, like any entrepreneur. Otherwise, uh, out of the re the results from the sale of the business, so it's capital gains. So the amount should be pretty small. And in most instances, we actually like to to see that the founders, as well as the CEO, if the CEO is not a founder, have skin in the game. So that we expect them to invest money and not take money out. Mara? 
Uh, again, agree with all that, but I, I think there's a lot of nuances here. If you want a lot of cash, a startup CEO isn't the place, but you've got to think creatively. It's probably obvious to everybody, but what's the package in terms of equity? What's the package in terms of health insurance and otherwise? And what works for you today may not work for you forever. So you may have a great CEO who is thinking about retiring, but doesn't really need to and say, stay with us for three months until we either get a different CEO or raise enough money to pay you. Don't think about it as an all or nothing, pay them 300,000 a year or walk away. Think creatively, think out of the box to get the person that you need, even if it's for a short period of time. So David, um, you know, we're talking about how do you get a good CEO for your company or other key team members, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, if you don't have any cash. Um, but there's a really beautiful book called Slicing Pie um, that explains how um, most entrepreneurs, you know, go about carving out equity in a very, very early stage business you know, before you get lawyers involved and have an ESOP or, or um, sorry, not an ESOP, uh, options pool. Um, so I don't, I, I'm not going to do a, a thesis presentation on the concepts of the book, but the, the idea is, you know, it's a negotiation. So somebody who's qualified and experienced is probably going to expect to be rewarded more than somebody who's new and passionate and, and really wants to um, join a mission that they care about. Not that the experienced person wouldn't care about it, but you find there's kind of two ends of the spectrum, right? Someone who's new and passionate and brings a lot of energy to the table and hopefully some special knowledge from the area that you're trying to, you know, bring your startup to address. And then someone who's super experienced and brings a ton of full life cycle uh, experience in, in startups, uh, you know, from seed to exit. Um, and the idea is, and slicing pies, you know, you, 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 you establish what somebody thinks that their time is worth, how much time they're going to commit, and you benchmark that against what you negotiate your time is worth and what, what, how much time you and the rest of your team are spending on it. Um, and you could even, you know, if you haven't done that with your existing team, you can do something that um, may be more fair than what originally was established. Maybe three people start a company and they decide, let's just divide up the ownership a, a quarter or sorry, <laughs> a third each. Um, but as time passes on, maybe one person is evidently working twice as much. So it really should be 50%, 25%, 25%. Uh, you know, you can calibrate along those lines. So slicing pie is a, is a really beautiful tool. Um, it's on Amazon. Um, but I mean, the short answer is you're going to compel them to join a company that's going to pay them in ownership that will be an outsized reward later when the company is a success. Thanks. So um, I said, you know, those other jobs. So we, we've so often we focus on the chief science officer and the CEO. Some CEOs are very multitasking. They can do the books. They can do the marketing. They can do the fundraising. They can, most can't. There needs to be someone who's, you know, making sure that your financial structure is set up correctly. There needs to be someone who, if you're starting to hire people, is making sure your HR stuff is set up correctly. With these early stage companies, a lot of times they don't invest in those areas, those operational areas. When you're looking at a company as investors and you start you know, doing due diligence, which with early stage companies is kind of hard, right? Because there's not a whole lot to, to see. Um, how much attention do you pay to that operational infrastructure that they're starting to set up? Uh, were you directing that at me? You can start. Sure. Uh, so it depends on the stage. I mean, it depends on the industry they're in. If it's a, a biotech business that is really IP oriented, they're not going to have, you know, a, a ton of revenue, probably zero, right? If it's a company that um, is in SaaS and they're doing things to generate their first customers, but maybe they're not paying them. I mean, the metrics you might be looking at are more around, um, uh, churn metrics and, 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 and adoption and use of the product versus any of the financial metrics. So with regard to investable team or investable business, 
Um, I think it definitely depends on the industry. Um, but I guess focusing on your original question, I, there, there's definitely certain activities that uh, you can either just do in house because they need to be done, like you mentioned bookkeeping, right? Um, and, and then the, in, in some circumstances, maybe your time is not effectively deployed to do those things when your expertise is in your market or in product development. It'd be better for you to spend all of your time on that and pay someone to do it. So, yeah, I mean, companies do use simple bookkeepers, but I don't necessarily consider that bookkeeping person part of the team. It's like you mentioned, sort of a, a automated or outsourced oper operationaliz operationalization of just the, the basic business functions that you know can help us get a better lens into the health of the business the organization and the structure of it so um, what's nice about having some of those things in place with respect to investable team is you know the three things at some point i was going to hopefully get across is like i think of an investable team as you know they bring special knowledge to the table everyone special knowledge around the industry and market they're going after the team is aligned and then the team is demonstrating their track record. So as an indirect function, um, and by track record, I mean in this specific business they're working on now. So if having a bookkeeper in place helps demonstrate um, very clearly and defensively the financial ebb and flow of the early stage activities of this business, that's great. If, if it's going to be uh, a lot clearer than someone trying to, you know, uh, go up the learning curve of keeping books for the first time, that might be a you know decent route. So I would just consider the, the things that you're trying to um, not pay for and do yourselves just because being in a startup is wearing a lot of hats. Um, you know, is this something that I can do effect, I or we on the team can do effectively? And it, it, is there any risk that if we don't do it properly, that that's going to look bad? Because what we really want to do is demonstrate competency, execution, and everyone being aligned and, and on the same vision and executing towards it. So, um, like with, with the topic okay. of this building, oh sure, perfect. So I want to make sure we we bring our our other panelists into the discussion. So um, and alignment's really important, and I think that's something we should revisit um, when we start talking about leadership in general. So Jim, life science companies have really complex regulatory grant bookkeeping and because of the amount of money that they ultimately need to raise cap tables um, when ATI is doing due diligence and I know that you guys have an entire due diligence process with a due diligence team that works together um, what are what is beyond the science what are the things that you're looking for that are being generated by that team? Well, you set it up exactly right, Joan. This is the, being successful in life sciences is hard. And uh, there are these gating issues like regulatory approvals that if you don't meet the standards of those, you don't succeed. And we're not interested in throwing our money into things that don't succeed. So the CEO that we expect to be hired here uh, understands that the pathway, you know, the regulatory approval is critical to success. Product development road mapping is critical to success. The operations are critical to success. If you don't get clear uh, qualification for your lab, you may be out of business in a few weeks. So we expect that the CEO is going to look for professionals of high quality who can provide the guidance or do the work directly. So let, what does that mean? It means that the CEO knows the needs of the company and knows his or her own limitations. I mean, a CEO may be an, a regulatory expert. Great. That means the CEO doesn't have to find one, but may know nothing at all about managing a, a product development roadmap or may not know anything about uh, 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 the process of taking raw materials and turning them into an operational product. So we expect that CEO to look for his or her peers for each of those things, some of which may be full-time, but some won't. Uh, regulatory uh, uh, guidance can come from a consultant part-time. Uh, obviously, yeah. you hire an attorney part-time to do your patent applications. Uh, others are going to be on the payroll. But can I can I add to that just briefly? Because I agree with Jim, but I think that the one of the key advantages of a small company, 
slash startup is nimbleness and ability to have uh, ability to change. So when you think about putting together that team and what you need on an operational basis, don't assume it's something that will last forever. Maybe you get lucky and it's perfect, but most of the time it isn't. Find something that will work for the next, I'm going to say six months, but not six years and not six days. You don't want it to be so short that you're changing all the time and people lose confidence in the CEO and the executive leadership team. But don't feel like you're making a decision that this head of manufacturing is right forever in the company Mm -hmm. because different stages require different expertise. And the challenge in a board or CEO is to provide stability, but not so much that the company ends up making wrong decisions. So you've got to walk that balance that says, this is your job for the next six months. And we hope we'll, you know, you'll grow into it. You'll need more um, talent, et cetera, but don't assume it's forever. You may need to make those changes and make sure back to the last question, just briefly, hire people who can deal with instability because at a startup company as you're growing you have to change your team as you move forward and mara you know the angels come in usually before the venture capitalists not always but usually um the company is more developed at that vc funding stage um, what are some of the things that you're looking for and when, a, when you're looking at a company where you're not talking about putting in 50, 100, a half a million, you're looking at building, you know, multiple million dollars into that company. How does the expectations of the team and its governance change? So for me, um, the first piece, and it is a continuation of the other one, is a team that argues well. So I'll start with the soft factors, a team that is not so dominated by the person at the top that they just listen. But on the other hand, a team that doesn't have so many type A egos that nobody, that everybody's arguing all the time over everything and they can't even decide what to have for lunch. Um, So you need a team that argues productively and moves forward. Secondly, what I look for is a team that covers all the bases full-time or part-time. So as Jim said, David implied, you know, it doesn't, you, no, rarely do you hire a lawyer full-time. There might be other positions you don't need to be hiring full-time. Um, thirdly, I look for clarity of roles. There's a phrase called MISI, mutually exclusive, comprehensively exhaustive. Um, basically, it means there aren't too many overlaps and everything is covered. I look for teams that are ideally messy. Now, I know I'm not naive. It's never perfect. There are always holes. There's always some overlap. But um, people know what they come in to do Friday morning, Sunday morning, or Tuesday morning. Um, that Those, to me, are the key parameters that I look for in that team when they start to have millions. If they have a few hundred thousand, then a few key people who know how to save money and work from home is fine. But when you're starting to have millions, it needs to be at least somewhat integrated and anticipatory of the next milestone, but not four milestones away, just at least one milestone away. Awesome. And so I want to... Um give a shout out to some of the, uh, the people who have joined us on this, this call from the National Association of Corporate Directors. So one of the things that I have seen across our community over the last decade of looking at these companies is that there's a real disparity. You know, there's no, there's no perfect board of directors, but in many cases, there's no board of directors at all, right? There may be an advisor, there may be a friend, but the true board of directors governance that can challenge and quite frankly can change the direction of a company. Um, We don't see a lot of that. How important is it to have a fiduciary board of directors as opposed to just advisors? Well, I'll jump in on that one. It's Please. it's simple for us. If, if there is no board of directors, if there is no majority of a board of directors that are represented or elected by the, uh, outs- the, the investors and outsiders, we're not interested in investing. 
handing money over to somebody who's going to make all the decisions is, in our view, foolishness. At the margin, there's no reason then for, for us to be able to control the CEO deciding to, to buy a Lamborghini for himself or herself. Yeah. It's just stupid not to have a, a, a group that can challenge and overrule a CEO. So completely, for us, it's completely. Yeah, completely agree with that. And I would go one step further. It needs to be a board that reasonably agrees with each other. And what I mean by that, I don't mean on detailed policy because you can't anticipate it, but all of, well, we've had one failure at Bluestone. Uh, the company sold, but not as much as we would have liked it to sell for. It's because some of the investors wanted a 10-year, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but five-year horizon. And they were expecting to invest over five years. Some of the other investors wanted this company sold in one year. Some of them wanted to go consumer and some of them wanted to go business. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but the idea is there were so many divergent interests on really important things on the board that this company was doomed to fail. And again, it didn't get as much money at the end as it should have. So I think if you're coming in as an investor or you're a CEO, you want to know your board reasonably um, has the same rough expectations. So, you know, two and a half years to sell versus three years is not a big deal. But those who want to flip it in a year and those who expect to have this at five years, big deal. Make sure you know. So, you know, at AZ Bio, obviously we're a nonprofit. Okay, we have a very large board of directors. Um, and each board member brings something unique to the organization, a skill set, um, a relationship, uh, an area of scientific or operational know-how. When a company is building their board of directors, should they be looking for people who think like them or should, or, you know, what value should that board member bring to the organization? What should the CEO be looking for? We, we publish on our website, uh, our, our standard term sheet, uh, which was you know, written by me and one of our attorneys. And we indicate in it that we expect that there will be at startup, at angel level, uh, a board of director, governing board of directors of five members uh, uh, with the expectation that the board will increase in size when uh, uh, the institutional investors come in because they'll want at least one board seat and it'll be time to reconfigure the board, maybe go to seven. Uh, we have a very simple view on this. Board members should be people whose principal objective is to make the company a better company that grows faster and basically exits faster. Uh, alignment with the thinking of the CEO is at best tangential uh, because we want people who can bring new ideas uh, or insights into part of the business that uh, the CEO may not be in, in him, him or herself uh, fully cognizant. I would agree with that. And I'd add one other thing, which is maybe hard to do as a CEO and hard to, if somebody's got a check handing it to you, but somebody who understands as a venture capitalist, their number one legal responsibility is to the company, not to their fund. And clearly people have some responsibility to their LPs and their fund, but their legal fiduciary responsibility is number one to that company and that they are not going to be so single-minded on the ROI that their fund is gonna get, that they won't make um, the right decisions for your company. It's really, really hard to figure this out. So what I would suggest if you're a CEO is get references. If you have the privilege of having different term sheets, which not everybody has that privilege of doing, but if you do get references from other CEOs, find out other boards as venture capitalists or angel investors sat on and make sure they're reasonable to work with. I, I a quick story, um, Joan, can I, one minute to this. I was, you know, I, I talked about my company that ultimately didn't succeed, but I, um, uh, we were ready to close uh, Columbus Day weekend, big deal on the East Coast. 
And the Friday night before, one of the venture capitalists called me and said, oh, we're ready to write the check. Um, all set. Just need you to um, fire the head of R&D this weekend. We don't really like him. Now, Joan is laughing. They, you know, they had expressed some interest that we might want to upgrade the head of R&D. And you know what? Probably the head of R&D needed to be upgraded. But they called me Friday night at six o'clock and told me this and said, with that, we'll be ready to close Tuesday. And I, um, I, I'm still emotional about it. I, I was shocked and horrified and called my lead investor and said, this is what they're insisting. And I, she took the, my lead investor took my recommendation, which is screw you. And I said, pound sand, you got to leave. If this is the way they were on the on the honeymoon period, you know, on the rehearsal dinner, this is the way they're going to be. I don't want to work with them. And one of the hardest decisions I had to make, because they were putting in of that 26 million, I think it was seven and a half. And, um, and then the, the lead investor didn't want to close and we had to postpone the financing three months. And I had no way of knowing that I would actually get um, the full financing and close this deal. We did, and we got a, b- a better investor. But um, when I had to make that decision, it was really tough, but I thought it'd be hell um, to work with these people and just insisted. So I said, pound sand, never want to work with you again. Um, and I didn't. And if you call me afterwards, I'll tell you who it was, but I, I'll, I'll be pleasant enough to not say it publicly. Um, we did close the deal. And what was the first thing I did? Fire the head of R&D. They were absolutely right, but the way they dealt with it was not the way I wanted to be dealt with. Thanks, and um, yeah, you know, we won't say who that was. So um, rapid fire, should board members be responsible for helping to raise money for the company? Yes or no, David? Um, helping, yes. Uh, Jim? In a secondary role. Mara. Yes, with introductions. Okay. Um, now, I'm a university spin out. I've never raised money in my life, and except I've gotten grants, but that's really different than asking for money from investors. Now, same question Do I need to find board members who can help me raise money? David. Need to? No. Jim. Nope, just come to us. Mayor. Yes. Yeah. So one of the things that I see so often is, you know, Jim's, and, and he explained it earlier so well, the scientist with a great idea who has been working and living in the grant world. Um, and I remember, and this goes back to 2007, so I'm dating myself. And I was sitting down with a CEO who was asking for an investment from me, which I ultimately did make. Um, and I was asking all these tough questions. And she, she said, why are you being so hard on me? You have the money. I said, yeah, I do. And at that time, I had worked 20 years personally to build up that money. I had a right to ask those questions if I was gonna consider writing that check. And so, you know, having people on your team that have the skill set to answer those questions, to anticipate those questions, um, but more importantly, you know, to tell you when you don't have the right answers to those questions is really important because you can spend a lot of time spinning your wheels chasing money that you're just not going to get. Um, Jim, you've seen companies like that. Oh, yeah. That's why I say come, uh, we're, our front door is wide open. It, it's something we do that's different from typical in, institutional investors who have requirements for, for warm introductions as, as their first gating process. We don't. We're, we're, we'll talk to anybody. And if you have a couple of scientists that say, hey, I've got a great idea, I want to raise some money, we'll take the time to say, you're not ready to raise money from anybody other than uh, maybe a few individuals who like to do that sort of thing. Go find yourself a CEO. 
And so they'll either take that advice or not, but that will be their first turn down if that's the case. So if they come back with a, new, a CEO, then we'll pay a lot more attention to them. And that CEO will know something about the process so that then we have uh, we'll, we can engage in a, in a useful dialogue. And as I say, we've invested in, in life science companies, you know, 35, 36 companies over the years. So it's not that we're saying no all the time. So David, you know, um, the other thing, and I think that mentoring concept that Jim brings up is really, really important. Um, we created the AZ Bio Peers Mentoring Program, which David is part of, um, to, to really spend time with these, um, you know, developing companies and help them move to the next level. And by the way, almost every single time we have a company in that cohort, you know, one of their primary things is I need to raise money. Um, so, as we have those discussions, David, um, what are some of the, without naming names of companies, what are some of the challenges that you're hearing from the companies on their ability to interface with the investors? So, I think the, just I'll answer this in two parts. One is the team being totally aligned on like exactly what we're doing um, and being able to bring to top of mind that core focus, because in reality, they're doing a lot of different things on a tactical activity basis, but like the purpose of the company, the direction it's heading, like what is trying to achieve the one sentence pitch, you know, that has to be so cemented in the minds of the entire team and almost like chanted, <laughs> like a like a you know an incantation uh you know almost when you wake up in the morning or go to bed and throughout the day just as a reminder of that that very specific goal so with that in mind like that alignment helps everyone be able to speak in one voice and i think uh going forth and getting the attention of whoever you might want to that would look at you and consider investing you know they don't know who you are you're coming onto the radar for the first time and having that very focused purpose and, and reason that you exist and what you're trying to achieve is like the, the hook that's going to get to like the next question. So like, that's, that's one part. Great. And the other part I think is just going into the unknown. It may be the first time doing this and, you know, you have perceptions from, I don't know, TV and shark tank that it's going to be scary or whatever. But um, in reality, it, it, it's the, you know, investors are out there to find really exciting, good deals. And if that's what you want to become, like it is a benefit to them to know who you are. So I think just having the confidence that we're doing something that excites us enough to work on this. And we need to do a very effective job of communicating to people who we are and what we're doing and extend the conversation from there. So just, just keeping it simple and just going through the grind. There's going to be a lot of no's, but um, you know, it's a law of averages thing. Yeah, the you know, it's interesting. A friend of mine um, was a CEO that found some technology that they really liked at a university, built a company around it in stealth mode using his own money for two years, then raised other people's, got other people's money and, you know, continued to build the company. And, you know, eventually, like what Mara talked about, it just didn't work out. Um, and, and it is scary. <laughs> it's real scary. Um, when we look at investable teams, there are going to be a lot of go, no go decisions that those teams are going to have to make. There are going to be, as Mara illustrated, tough um, personnel decisions that they're going to have to make. How strong do these leaders need to be? Mara? I mean, incredible. I mean, it, it's e too easy to say incredibly strong, but um, the question, I, I would phrase it a little bit differently. They have to be open to feedback, which I've said many times, but then decisive. That to me is the key piece. Is that what you mean, or am I am I oversimplifying it? Well, since uh, we're we're coming up on the five minute warning, simple is good. Okay, so right. they need to be decisive and communicative. 
So not just sending an email saying yes, no, or 17. They need to be able to describe why they made that decision and communicate with people. Everybody says, and I believe it, you don't want any surprises at a board meeting. Jim, when you're looking at a team and you're doing due diligence, do you just take what they tell you at face value or do you have other conversations? Oh, we have lots of other conversations. <laughs> with anybody that uh, uh, we think is appropriate. If there are some kinds of uh, customers, we'll talk to customers. Uh, uh, we'll talk sometimes to former colleagues and employees or employers of people uh, to understand how they work in, in a team. Uh, we'll investigate their experiences as experts in whatever field there are, uh, because anybody can say anything they want about what they do. I mean, all you have to do is read the headings and LinkedIn to on anybody almost to, to see wonderful people who can do almost everything. David, briefly, what's the most important thing that you look for in a team? Uh, demonstrated progress over a meaningful period of time. And, and so I think a lot of startups overlook this, the drumbeat of communication needs to start early, continue and never stop. I mean, unless you're in the advantageous position and, you know, Mara's, and I think Jim mentioned this earlier, like if you're in a position where you have multiple term sheets and you're negotiating the best terms on earth, that's great. But for a lot of startups, it's a grind, right? So if I want to raise money by January, I need to start probably the previous January or March. And by, by drumbeat, I mean, communicating who you are, what you're doing, what you're going to do next. And then when that next thing is done over and over and over so that what, is really being communicated as hypothetical starts to be totally seen as, Oh, they're doing what they said they're going to do. That Great, to me thanks. is totally impressive. Uh, Mara, number one thing you look for in an investable team. Um, operational excellence and ability to shoot for the stars while communicating. Jim. Do each of the team members understand their own personal limit, professional limitations and those of each other? Awesome. All right. So we, as I said, we are coming up on the end of our hour. Um, I want to um, you know, really thank our panelists, but I also want to give them a chance to, to share some closing thoughts. Um, and Mara, since we started with you, let's let's start with you on this round too. Well, I mean, you've asked great questions. So um, uh, intellectual, I'll, I'll try to phrase it in a slightly different way. I look for a team with intellectual honesty. And what I mean by that goes partly to what Jim said, team that knows what they can do and knows what they can't do. A team that has the ability to communicate good news and bad news. I get tired of teams that are great about bragging, but then when things go wrong, it takes them two weeks to tell the rest of the board. And lastly, the um, flight over Cleveland test, a team that I like enough that I don't mind sitting next to them while circling Cleveland. Um, uh, that one comes third and you have to decide how much you like people or otherwise, but people that you are proud to be associated with. Great. Jim. It's two things. I think one is that, uh, if you've got a, a great idea, go for it. Don't hesitate. Recognizing this is hard. It's not a re that if that's an, if it's too hard for you to move forward, then just go do something else entirely. But if it's not too hard for you, go do it. But don't blame other people, particularly people that don't give you money for the difficulties or the lack of success that you have. Success is in your own hands. David. Yeah, so the, the three things that I mentioned earlier, special knowledge across the team, specific to the opportunity you're pursuing, the team being aligned and in sync around what they're doing, being able to communicate that, and then demonstrating that track record. You know, it's not good if just the CEO is joining the call after call, you know, from months to end. Get the whole team on there, have the CEO engaging the rest of the team to show how he is leading people that are as, or perhaps more talented, he or her, excuse me, than the CEO, right? Uh, showcasing 
that everyone is in sync along the same vision, you're getting things done, important milestones are being met, and you really truly possess special knowledge around this opportunity across the entire team. You really want that to shine through. Awesome. So here's mine. An investable team shows up. So many times I will see companies and I go to their website and I see amazing board members and I see amazing scientific advisory board members and I see people that are on their operational team that I know don't work there. And it's really, really important that if so, you say that somebody's on your team, they show up. A phenomenal, world-class expert who's on the board of 200 other companies is not going to give me a real warm and fuzzy that you have that person's attention when it matters. So when you're when I, I look at an investable team, I want to know how engaged that team is, how supportive that team is. If they're going to be doing the things that I think they're supposed to be doing or they're window dressing on a website. When Jim says, you know, they go check on things, let me tell you, they're going to call those people. So that integrity as as mara says of you know having a team that really is a team as david points out um, a team that shares the vision is using their unique skill sets to move it forward and is getting results because at the end of the day as investors we look at teams as a way to foreshadow what results the teams are going to get. Investors don't make profits on teams. Profits come from results. Teams create results. So when we look at that concept of an investable team at each stage of your company, as Mara very adeptly pointed out, you need to surround yourself with people that know things you don't know. You need to access experts who can give you feedback that you don't have. And then most importantly, as Mara says, you need to demonstrate that you can listen to them, process the information, and then make good decisions. And one of the best decisions you can make right now is to sign up for the White Hat Life Science Investor Conference during Arizona Bioscience Week because it's a great place to show up. It is a great place for you to meet investors. We have investors coming in from around the country. I have an investor friend of mine who's going to be speaking on a panel who manages $3 billion assets under management. We have... CEOs that have been there and done that, I'd be willing to bet that all of our panelists are going to be in the room. Mary, you better be. She's your co-chair of the conference. <laughs> um, but having those opportunities where you can listen to other companies tell their story, having those opportunities where you can hear from panels like this one that are sharing their insights and equally important, making those relationships, building relationships that you will continue to reinforce year after year after year so that when your company's ready, they're ready for you. So I hope we'll see everybody. Uh, if you can't find the website, just go to azbio.org, go to the events drop down, and you will see right at the top, White Hat Investors. Um, and plan to join us for dinner on the 28th at the AZ Bio Awards. It's included in your ticket. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, <coughs> thanks to our panelists, our mentors, our audience, and for all of the people that support the e health innovation ecosystem here in Arizona, because together we really are accomplishing some pretty great things. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. Thank you for your leadership, Thanks. Joan.